كتاب الله دستوري وخير الخلق أسوتنا لسنته جلا نوري لهدي الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Khalid Hassan. I'm from the UK. I'm a student in the faculty of Sharia, uh, the College of Sharia uh, in um, the University of Qasim in Saudi Arabia. Um, yeah, gr growing up, like most Muslims in the UK, I grew up in your average Muslim family, you know, five, six, seven kids went to the local madrasa in the masjid, studied Quran from the, like the age of seven, all the way until basically the age of 14. So, you know, I did the hifd and all of that stuff, the Arabic school and that whole kind of thing. Alhamdulillah, my parents, you know, they were praying, they were practicing. So, alhamdulillah, they wanted me to, you know, um, learn Quran and, and those things. But like many people in the UK, you know, you go for a phase where peer pressure and things like that uh, affect you but um, alhamdulillah Allah saves me from all of that alhamdulillah I started to practice from um, you know from from a, from a young age from quite a young age in my teens and you know it snowballed into into you know studying here in Al-Qasim and I thank Allah Azza wa for that basically what happened was um, at the time in London uh, this is you know 2007, 2008 kind of times, the da'wah of the kind of takfiri groups was very strong in the UK. They had galvanized YouTube. YouTube was the main weapon and they'd galvanized YouTube. And as a young Muslim, uh, a very impressionable Muslim at an impressionable age, you could argue that, um, you know, I followed the masses in that particular thing. So what ended up happening was, was that I started to pray my khamsa salawat and things like that at the age of 15, 16. And you know, you don't really have a lot of guidance with regards to who you're taking from. Because you know, your parents are, if you like traditional Muslims, they might have knowledge, but they don't know what's going on on the ground with the youth. So, you know, YouTube is your teacher, if you like. Google is your teacher. You know, and you pick the sheikhs and whoever, whoever's voice you, you take a liking to is the person you follow. And whoever has the best kind of, um, I would say, media techniques, you follow them. And that's what basically happened. There was obviously a known group in the UK who were known to say, we want to establish this in the UK. We want the law of Allah. We want this, we want that protesting, you could say being very um, troublesome in their da'wah, you could, one could argue, or a person could say, they were very troublesome in the way in which they went about calling to Allah Azza wa Jal. And obviously Allah says, Udu'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah. Call to the way of your Lord with hikmah. So Allah Azza wa Jal calls us to call to Allah, to, to the religion of Islam with hikmah. And I found that, for example, you know, they weren't kind of doing those things. So as I began to, you know, go with this group, I started to notice a few things. Number one, they were very quick to speak about their fellow Muslims in a bad light, in terms of takfir and other things like that. And they would make mockery of major scholars or scholars of the religion. And this is what they do to control the youth. They basically create a situation whereby the scholars of Islam are somehow anti-Muslim and are the reason behind the failure of Islam in modern times or something like that. So what they do is that they take away the status of the scholars in your eyes to the point where you have nobody left. And then they say, okay, because, there are, because these scholars are not you know, if you like, they're not Islamic, they're not pro-Islam, you have to take from us. And that's what they do. Um, and that's how they win their arguments. It's not by fiqh, 
It's not by usul, it's not by any of those things. It's these scholars are with so and so, and you can't take from them. And this is the mentality that was you know, prevalent at that time. So as I began to be with this jama'ah, I noticed that many people in the jama'ah were ignorant. And me having grown up in a Muslim household, you know, my father himself being a student of knowledge, speaking Arabic, teaching people al Islam, I knew more than um, some of them. And not saying that I know more than them in, 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 a, in a way of kibr, but I understood that their arguments were not making sense and that there's more, there's more that meets the eye than what they claimed. So I realized, you know, faults in their character. And this is not, I'm not trying to curse anybody, but I started to realize and see that there was, a, there, was a, there was little attention paid to the Qur'an. There was little attention paid to learning the Arabic language. There was little attention paid to doing things like praying in jama'ah. And I was a person, walillahi alhamd, and you know, we don't try to praise anybody, but praying in jama'ah was something which I, was, which I used to do. So when I found out that they didn't pray in jama'ah and things like this, I said to myself, no, hold on, what's, what's going on here? Yani, something's going on. And because of that, it, uh, it raised some alarms. I realized that the only way for me to tackle the issues I had was to seek knowledge. And what do I mean by I had to tackle the issues I had? When I was with that jama'ah, I had a lot of shak, doubt. When I mean shak, not shak in the religion of Islam, I had shak in the arguments they were putting forward. I was thinking these arguments are weak arguments. What happened was that they would always talk about Sheikh Ibn Baz and Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen and say they are this and they are that. So I said, hold on. I, from what I know, Sheikh Ibn Baz and Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen, they are, some of, they are from the maraji' of this ummah. They are, you know, they are from the people that we, we refer back to in our affairs. So I said, I'm going to read a book of Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen because this, if they're saying something about him, it's only fair I read a book of Ibn Uthaymeen because this is what you claim Ibn Uthaymeen did. Let me read a book of Ibn Uthaymeen. So I picked up the book, Sharh al Thalathatul Usul, in English, and I read it, and I was amazed. I was taken back by the way the Sheikhs his taqsimat, the way he would divide things, um, the fawaid, the benefits he would bring to, 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 to the thing he was explaining. He was so scholarly in his approach. He was so authoritative in his way of explaining things. I knew immediately that this tariqah, this way that these people are following is batila. Tariqah batila. It's a, something which يعني, holds no weight. When you, hold, when you bring a person who speaks no Arabic language, has no background khalfiya in the religion of al-Islam and then you bring a person who is an allama, knows al-Islam, has studied al-Islam, has khalfiya in Islam, there was no question whose side I was going to take. So then I went on to read another book of Ibn Uthaymeen and it was Sharh al-Aqeedah wa Satiya. The, you know, the, 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 the famous book of Aqeedah by Ibn Taymiyyah and I was again blown away. By this time I had plucked up the courage and I said, I'm leaving this jama'ah because they were not my friends. The friends I knew that were practicing Islam were the people going to halaqat of Qur'an, were learning Arabic, were going to durus. So I was juggling between two different camps. The camp that was doing the protesting and things like that and the camp who wanted to sit down and learn al-Islam. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّمَا الْعِلْمُ بِالتَّعَلُّمْ Verily learning or verily knowledge is by learning, making a physical effort to learn. So what happened was that I started to go back to memorize the Qur'an and I grew a love for the Qur'an that had been gone for a very long time. And by doing that, I realized, Khalid, you're wasting your time with these people. You have to leave. So I plucked up the courage to leave and walillahi alhamd, I left. Now comes another problem. You're confused. You left one jama'ah 
or you left what that jama'ah was following and now you're in a wilderness, where do you go? Who do you take knowledge from? It was a very scary moment in my life because I didn't know what, where do I go from here now? I had been with this extreme group, I had been here, I had been there, I had met crazy personalities in London through my time and I thought to myself, where do I go from here? And I said to myself, the only way you will get out of this is if you learn the Arabic language. You have to learn Arabic. Otherwise, you'll continue. It will become a perpetual cycle of you being hoodwinked by this individual and that individual. It will be continuous. You will be like a yo-yo. You will swing any way depending on what they tell you. So I had to make that decision. So I, I said to myself, you know, I'm going to learn Arabic and another friend of mine, a brother, Jazahullah al-Khair, you know, he learned Arabic as well. We, we, we signed up for a course in East London at the Tayyibun Institute. And this was many years back now, long, long time ago. And alhamdulillah, we, 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 we started to learn Arabic and I studied there for almost three years. And alhamdulillah, um, I learned a lot. And Wallahi, there was a big difference between my time with this group and my time learning Arabic. My time learning Arabic in London was one of the best times of my life because I realized that Islam, يعني, Islam is a vast religion. It's not something which is a tunnel, it's not a tunnel vision, uh, 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 it's not a tunnel view kind of religion. You know, it's just like this. Islam is wasi, deenun wasi. Okay, so I remember my sadr, my chest feeling open when I was learning Arabic and, and learning all these new things. Whereas when I was with the other group, I was, my, my chest was dayyak. My chest was, was tight to the point where, wallahi, I swear by Allah Azza wa Jal, I would sometimes be on my own and because of how dayyak my chest felt, I would cry. Out of nowhere, I would cry at how, how dayyak my chest felt. I didn't know what it was. And when I started to learn Al-Islam and learn the Arabic language and meet brothers, like-minded brothers with good akhlaq, my chest became open. Wallahi, I felt as if something had fell. And alhamdulillah, you know, I learned a good, a good amount of Arabic in the UK that a person can learn. And I took a flight to al Medina and I applied for the Jami'ah of Medina, Jami'ah Islamiyah bil Medina. And alhamdulillah, I didn't get accepted, but... Alhamdulillah, يعني, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah brought back another, um, replaced it with something else, and I got my um, admission to go into the University of Qasim. Walillahi alhamd. How did I hear about Qasim? Um, you know, when you're searching for something, it becomes an obsession. And when I was learning the Arabic language, Trying to get to Medina was my entire life. It was my entire life from, for about two years. It was my entire life. That is all I wanted to do. I wanted to learn Arabic. I wanted to study Al-Islam. And I wanted to go to Al-Medina. This was all I wanted to do. So you begin to search obsessively about different avenues you can take. So I was going on countless numbers of websites. And I remember I came across the website of a sheikh, Muhammad Tim Humble. It was called, So You Want To Be A Student. And it was a blog. And he had written about his life in Medina and how it is Medina. And I remember I would read that page again and again and again. And I'd just read it and just try to soak in what he's saying. Then I'd read it again, obsessively. Um, and then there was other websites that I found. And I came across a website of Canadian students talking about their time in Al Medina. And it had links and it said MK Ahmed. So I clicked on it and it was a brother who was studying in Qasim and he spoke about his time in Qasim and it said and it said on his website that there's a Qismun Minh, a there's a section for scholarships for non Saudi students from all over the world to either learn Islam or other kind of degrees. But um, I went I, I I I saw how life was there. And I knew that I had applied for Al-Medina and I thought, let me put my eggs in more than one basket. 
and I applied for there as well as Medina and I was accepted I was accepted Alhamdulillah and that's how I came across um, Jama'at al Qasim. I couldn't believe it I couldn't believe what I, what I saw that my name was actually there and to be honest with you in my heart of hearts my gut feeling was was that Allah Azza wa Jal was accepting my dua and the reason why I say that was because I saw things that was leading me up to going to Saudi Arabia I was seeing things in the sense where whereas before I had never met a student of knowledge ever who graduated from Medina by the time I started learning Arabic and making dua day and night to get into Saudi Arabia to study Islam I started meeting on almost a monthly basis people who could speak Arabic and I graduated from Medina and it was very strange because these people had been praying with me in the same masajid but when I, I started when I made the niyyah to try to get into Saudi Arabia it was as if Allah Azza wa Jal caused all these people to, 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 to give me their advice and to give me you know their, um, their, their experiences so I could manage and actually survive in Saudi Arabia and it was something strange I have never seen come across stuff like that in my life where literally I would you know I was meeting people who had studied from Azhar you know randomly in public I'd, you know I'd be on the bus trying to read something and there'll be a person next to me and he's got paint all over his body he's a laborer he's a laborer this man this man was an african man from uganda he had paint all over his body and i was reading and i saw him looking over looking in a strange way and i was very intimidated What's, what does this man want from me and then he says he starts to speak to me in arabic and he says you know i graduated from you know i have a degree in tafsir from azhar and, and I couldn't believe it, this man is covered in paint and he has a degree from, you know, and these weird things that were, were happening, you know, not weird things, but, you know, Allah Azza wa Jal making the tariq easy for you, you know, for you to reach your destination. I realized that, you know, when my name was on the list, it was as if, okay, that's why all those things happened. It wasn't a cat out of the hat experience for me. So I got in contact with some brothers in Al Qasim. They brought me my, um, my visa, you know, me and another brother from the UK who's studying with me presently, we, um, you know, we got our stuff done and we flew to Al Qasim. We, you know, we went to Heathrow Airport, flew to Jeddah, from Jeddah to Qasim. When I landed in Al Qasim, it was another shock. I thought to myself, what have you done? You have made a great mistake. Why have you brought yourself to this place? And the reason why I say that is because in the Arab world, when it's daytime, everything is dead, especially after Dhuhr. We landed after Dhuhr in Qasim. Qasim is a, not a rural place, but it's not a major city like Jeddah, Mecca, Medina, Riyadh. So I land in Al Qasim and there's nothing, absolutely nothing. It's almost like a, a ghost town. And I remember thinking, oh Allah, oh Khalid, what, what have you done? Why have you brought yourself here? And the feeling of feeling homesick, will I make it? The fear came again. Whereas before, when I spoke about previously, I felt fear after leaving that jama'ah. I felt another sense of fear. Will I be able to stay here? Will I be able to handle this place? What, what's, what, what are the things that are going to be thrown in my face? Do I have the, you know, the mental and physical strength? To, to withstand what's going to be thrown at me and alhamdulillah you know through through patience and trial and error to this very day you know like all the other students in Qasim, in Medina, in Mecca, in Riyadh we, we, we manage and, and we can only thank Allah for surviving and managing so alhamdulillah that's the uh, thing yes yeah, so, so. <laughs> yeah um, in terms of the environment you know Qasim is a, is, is a quiet place um, Medina has, you could say, 
the students of Qasim, I don't know if it's said in Medina, but the students of Qasim speak about Medina and say in Medina you have a, what they say in Arabic, Jawul Ilmi. It's almost as if there's a, a weather of Ilm or a season of Ilm or a kind of, you know, wind of Ilm, you know, a gust of Ilm, always, everywhere. In Qasim, it, 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 you know, it, you have to push yourself harder to learn because we don't have the Masjid al Nabawi and things like that. But there's obviously, having said that, there's many, you know, um, uh, positives, you know, in terms of um, having a lot of time to yourself, um, not being able to waste time all the time, and, you know, really trying to master what you do and not having too many distractions. So I would describe the three years that I've been in Al Qasim, Walillahi Alhamd. I praise Allah Azza wa Jal um, for the opportunity that I've had. And I hope that Allah Azza wa Jal gives the people watching these videos, this, you know, the sincere of them, um, the, the true ability to go to abroad, wherever it may be, and really benefit in seeking Islamic knowledge. You're always going to face hardships when you, when you um, try to pursue something which has true moral value or true meaning to it. And that's why there's a qa'id in the religion of Islam, there's a rule, in the religion of Islam that says al jazaa min jins al-amal that your reward is based on the kind of action that you did and studying something which you believe in you may and you may not have a future and you may not find necessarily work after you're doing it it takes a, a different kind of Patience, and it takes a different kind of love uh, um, to, 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 to study Islamic sciences. Um, and um, I would say that um, you just have to constantly be patient because things will be thrown in your way all the time. This life is a test from Allah and everyone's test is different. Some people their test is wealth, you know, other people their test is their children. And maybe for us at this present time in our life, for us students of knowledge, our test is making it to the finish line, passing your exams, going to those durus outside, really trying hard, you know, to really make it to the finish line. Because unfortunately, you know, many people don't make it and that's the reality. So it's a constant battle to try to defeat your nafs in, you know, studying the religion of Allah Azza wa Jal. And, um, I can only say that um, it makes you a different person. You'll never be the same. And a person who's never gone out to study will never truly understand what a student goes through. And that's another advice I would like to say for those people in the West who hear of a student who graduates from Medina, graduates from Riyadh, graduates from Umm al-Qura, says, oh, oh, he's just a graduate, he just graduated. Oh no, he just stayed there for five years. Oh no, he's not a sheikh. You have no idea what that person goes through psychologically, mentally, physically in trying to learn Islam, learning, learning a new language, being with people he's never been with before. You have no idea. And I would say that um, next time you hear of a brother who has studied or a brother who has, you know, given a portion of his youth to learning al Islam, I would ask that. You give them a bit of respect because I think that's the least that they deserve. My future aspirations. Um, it's a very hard question. You know, obviously all of our aspiration is to get to Jannah. Is, you know, for the people that we've wronged in our life to forgive us. Um, to make the world a better place. Because you study knowledge to solve the problems of the people. Teach the people, you know. Um, bring warring factions together is to really make the world a better place you know in the sense where we can help the Muslims and help non-Muslims become Muslim but in short I would like to obviously be involved in the field of da'wah in any way that may be teach the people teach people what I've learned um, and I'd love to give time to teaching the Muslims um, and that, that's, that's what I hope to do if Allah gives me the tawfiq to graduate and come back to the UK.